Mm. 36 looks kind of good. We're going to do that. 36 looks good. So, chapter one, introduction. Truly, thoughts are things and powerful things that... At that. Sorry. Uh, truly, truly, thoughts are things and powerful things at that when they are mixed with def definiteness of purpose, persistence, and the burning desire of their translation into riches or other material objects at a little more than 30 years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate with of the great Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. Oh, def yeah, definite. What? Uh, he wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire to reality and you will have a better understanding of 13 principles which led to riches. When the, this desire or impulse of thought first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know how he did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not know how ha have enough money to pay his railroad 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 fare to Orange, New Jersey. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated to the uninitiated this means that he went to the east orange on a freight train Mind baggage. So does that literally mean like, um, no baggage, um, no like, no pe like, uh, like no people on the train? It's like a, a freight train. Yeah. Um, he presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory, and announced he had come to go into business with m the inventor. He, in speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Tramp but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to take willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it he is sure to win i gave him the opportunity he asked for it because i saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded uh subsequently or subsequent events per proved that no mistake was made just what young Barnes said to mr edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought 
Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young's man. The it could not have been the young man's appearance, which got him the start of Edison in the Edison office. For that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did he did get a chance to work in the Edison offices offices at a very normal wage. No no, no nominal oh at the very nominal wage doing work that was un unimportant to Edison but most important to Barnes because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the converted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose, but something important was happening in Barnes. Apparently nothing happened to the conveyed converted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind here um, as his definite major purpose but something important was happening in Barnes mind he was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison Psycholog uh, psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business associ association with Edison. Moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He did not say to himself, ah well, um, jeez. Oh well, what's the use, I guess? I'll change my mind and try for a salesman job. A salesman's job. But he did say, but he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison and I'll accomplish this and if it takes the remainder of my life. He, me he meant it. What a different story men would have to tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by the purpose, that purpose, until it had time to become an all consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination, his persi persistence in standing back of the single desire was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him to opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form and from When it opportunity came, it appeared in a different form, and from a different oh a oh and from a different direction that Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes. 
disguised in the form of a misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this way, this is why so many fail to recognize the opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device known as the time, known at the time as the Edison dictating machine, now the Ediphone. His, the Ediphone? His salesmen were not enthusiastic over the machine. Uh, they did not believe it could be sold with a, without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer looking machine, which interested no one but Barnes and the inventor. Uh, <coughs> Barnes knew he could sell the Edison dictating machine. He suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute the distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association grew the slogan maybe made by Edison and installed by Barnes. The business alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it, Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has prov proved that one really may think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes had been worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it could it has brought him two to three million dollars, but the amount whatever it has become whatever the it is becomes insignificant when compared with a greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that an um, intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into a physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought him literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. He had no influence, but he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. With these intangible forces, he made his self number one man with the greatest inventor who ever lived. Now let us look at different situations and study a man who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches but lost it because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. This is all in the movie. Um, Think and Grow Rich, the legacy movie. It's like 27 to 30 cent dollars. I don't know. But if you actually wanted to watch this, ain't that bad. But um, essentially, this is in it. This, like, these little things are in it. And I think, I'm pretty sure that the movie was the, just the introduction of this. But, anyways, three feet from gold. That's the next section. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake. At one time or another, an uncle of R.U. Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days and went west to dig 
and grow rich. That is awkward to say, but... He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the brains of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with a pick and shovel. The going was hard, but his lust for gold was defiant. Oh, definite. I keep saying defiant, and that's not right. Um, after weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland, told his relatives and few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery and had it shipped. And The uncle and Darby went back to work in the mine work the mine the first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter the r returns provided proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado a few more cars uh, of that ore would clear the debts uh, then would come the big killing and profits Killing and profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and Uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. Some junk men are dumb, but not this one. He called a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not, some, not familiar with fault lines. His calculation showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where Darby had stopped drilling. That is exceedingly where it was found. It, or that, that is where exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors because of their faith in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although he was years of in doing it, which is insane. And I think that was in Colorado in the movie It. Announced that it was like in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, it's in the book. Um, long afterward, mis long afterward, Mr. Darby uh, recouped his losses, and many times over, when he made the discovery that the desire that desire can be transmuted into gold, the discovery came after he went into business of selling life insurance, remembering that he lost. A huge fortune because he stopped three feet short of gold. Darby profited by the experience in his chosen work by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. I stopped three feet away from gold, but... I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby is one of the small group of... Darby is one 
is one of the small group of fewer than 50 men who sell more than a million dollars of life insurance annually. He owns his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in gold mining business. Before success comes in any man's life, he is sure to meet with much temporary defeats and perhaps some failure when he when dis when defeat overtakes a man the easiest and most logical thing is to quit that is exactly what the majority of men do more than 500 of the most successful men this country has ever known told known told the author their greatest success came just from one step beyond the point which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. A 50 cent lesson in persistence. Shortly after Miss Darby, Mr. Darby received his degree from University of Hard Knocks and had decided to profit by experience in the gold mining business. He had the good fortune to be present on the occasion that Pru th um, had a good fortune to present on an occasion that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean no. Say that. Say that. To, uh, oh God! I got. I got a funny joke about that. No, don't do it. D no does not mean always no. <laughs> One afternoon, he was helping his uncle grind wheat in an old-fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on the on which a number of colored sharecropped farmers lived quietly the door was opened and the small colored child the daughter of the tenant walked in and took her place near the door the uncle looked up saw the child and barked at her roughly what do you want meekly the child replied my mammy say send her 50 cents I'll not do that, the uncle retorted. Now you run on home. Yes, uh, sa. The child replied, but she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work, but so busily engaged that he did not pay enough attention to the child to observe that she did not leave. When he looked up and saw, still standing there, he yelled at her, I told you, go home. On home. Now go or I'll take a switch to you. I'm assuming that's like a thing for horses. The little girl said, yes, sir. Uh, but she did not bulge an inch. The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper, picked it up, a barrel uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper picked up a barrel stave and started towards the child with an expression on her face that indicated trouble darby held darby held his breath he was certain he was about to witness a murder he knew his uncle had a, f a fierce temper. He knew that uh, colored children were not supposed to defy white people in that part of the country. When the uncle reached to the spot where the child was standing, she quietly stepped forward one step, looked up into his eyes, and screamed at the top of her shrill voice, My mommy's gotta have that 50 cents. The uncle stopped, looked at her for a minute, and slowly, slowly laid the barrel, the barrel stave, on the floor, and put his hands in his pocket to look 
out. Took out half a dollar and gave it to her. The child took the money and slowly backed towards the door, never taking her eyes off the man whom she had just conquered. After she had gone, the uncle sat down on a box and looked out the window into space for more than ten minutes. He was pondering with awe over the over the whipping he had just taken. Mr. Darby too was doing the same some thinking that was the first time in all experience that he had seen a colored child deliberately deliberately master an adult white person how did she do it what happened to his uncle that caused him to lose his fierceness and become a docile as a lamb what's what strange power did this child use to make to use that made her master over her superior this these and other similar questions flashed into Darby's mind about he did not find the answer until years later when he told me the story strangely the story of the unusual experience was told to the author in the old mill on a very spot where the uncle took his whipping strangely to I had devoted nearly a quarter of a century to the study of power which enabled an ignorant illiterate colored child to conquer an intelligent man as we stood there that musty old mill mr darby repeated the story of the unusual conquest and finished by asking what can you make of it what strange power did that child use that so completely whipped my uncle the answer to his question will be found in the principles described in this book the answer is full and complete it contains details and instructions sufficient to enable anyone to understand and apply the same force which the little child accidentally stumbled upon keep your mind alert and you will observe exactly what the strange power came to the rescue of the child you will catch a glimpse of this power in the next chapter somewhere in this book you will find an idea that will quicken your receptive powers and place at your command for your own benefit this same irresponsible irresistible power the awareness of this power may came to you in the first chapter or it may flash into your mind in some sub subsequent chapter it may come in the form of a single idea or it may come in the nature of the plan of a plan or purpose again it may cause you to go back into your past experience of failure or defeat and bring to the surface some lessons by which you can regain all that you lost through defeat after I had described to you mr. Darby the power unwi unwittingly used by the little colored child he quickly retracted his 30 cents 30 he quickly retra retraced his 30 years of experience as a life insurance salesman and frankly acknowledged that his success in the field was due to due in no small degree to the lesson he had learned from the child. Mr. Darby pointed out every time a prospect tried to bow, bow me out, Without buying, I saw that 
child standing there in the old mill, her big eyes glaring in defiance. And I said to myself, I got to make this sale. The better portion of all sales I have made were made after people had said no. He recalled to his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold, but he said, he recalled, he recalled uh, to him, uh, he recalled to his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold, but he said that ex that experience was a blessing in disguise and it taught me to it taught me to keep on keeping on no matter how hard the going may be a lesson i need to learn before i could success succeed in anything this uh the story of mr darby and his uncle the colored child in the gold mine doubtless will doubtless will be read by hundreds of men who make their living by selling life insurance and to all these the author wishes to offer the suggestion that Darby owes to these two experiences his ability to sell more than a million dollars of life insurance every year life is strange and often irresponsible both these successes and failures have their roots in simple experiences mr darby's experience were commonplace and simple enough yet they had the answer to his destiny in life therefore they were as important to him as life itself his profited he profited by these two dram dramatic experiences because he analyzed them and found the lesson they taught but what of the man who has neither time nor inclination to study the failure in such in search of knowledge that may lead to success where and how is he to learn the art of converting defeat into stepping stones to opportunity in answer to these questions this book was in the, oh in answer to these questions this book was written the answer called for a description of 13 principles but remember as you read the answer you may be seeking to the question which has caused you to ponder over the strangest of life may be found in your own mind though some idea plan uh idea plan or purpose which may uh spring into your mind as you read yeah i'm i was lost i was like where did i go <laughs> um <coughs> One sound idea is that all that needs to achieve success, the principles described in this book contain the best and the most practical of all that is known concerning ways and means of creating useful ideas. Before we go any further in our approach to describe description to the description of these principles we believe you are entitled to receive this important suggestion when riches begin to come they come quickly in search in such great abundance that one wonders where they have been hiding during all those lean years this is an astounding statement and all the more so when we take into consideration the popular belief that, ri that riches come only in those who work hard and long.
when you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with defi definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work, you and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire the state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research analyzing more than 25,000 people because I too wanted to know how wealthy men become that way. Without the, without the research, this book could never have been written. Here, take notice of a very significant truth, viz. Oh, here, take notice of a very significant truth, viz. The, di the business depression started, the business depression started in 1929 the, and continued on to an all-time record of destruction until some time after the President Roosevelt entered office. Then the depression Depression began to fade into nothing, just as an elect um, electrician in the theater raises the lights so gradually that darkness is transmuted into light before you realize it. So did the spell of fear in the minds of the people gradually fade away and become faith. Observe very closely. As soon as you master the principles of this philosophy and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles, your financial status will begin improve, begin to improve, and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset before you your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. Page 19. Yeah, I forgot to say the pages, but anyways. Um, on the main weakness of mankind, one of the main weaknesses of mankind is the average man's familiarity with the word impossible. He knows all the rules which will not work. He knows all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful and are willing to stake everything on those rules. If a great many years, a, a great many years ago, I purchased a fine dictionary. The first thing I did did with it was to turn to the word "impossible" and neatly clipped it into the clipped, neatly clipped it out of the book, and would not be an unwise thing for you to do. Success comes from those who become successful consciousness. Consciousness? Um, one second. One. Um, success comes from those who become success consciousness. Con consciousness? Um, success comes from those who become success conscious oh um, failure to come to those failure comes to those who indifferently failure comes to those who indifferently allows them to themselves to become failure con conscious failures come to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious so you want to become success success conscious versus being failure conscious um okay the object of this book is to help all who seek it to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to the success consciousness. Another weakness found in all another weakness found in altogether too many people is the habit of measuring everything and any everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. 
Some who will read this will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They can not think in terms of riches because their thoughts, habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. These unfortunate people remain, remind me of a prominent Chinese who came to America to, edu to be educated in American ways. He attended the University of Chicago. One day, President Harper met this young Oriental on the campus, stopped to chat with him for a few minutes, and asked what had impressed him as being the most noticeable char um, characteristic of the American people. Why? The Chinaman exclaimed. The queer, the queer slant of the eyes. Your eyes are off slant. What do we say about the Chinese? Queer slant of your eyes. Your eyes are off slant. What do we say about the Chinese? We refuse to believe that which we do not understand. We foolishly believe that our own limitations are the proper measure of limitations. Our own limitations are the proper measurement of limitations. Sure, the other fellow's eyes are off slant because they are not the same as your own. Millions of people look at the achievement of Henry Ford after he has arrived and envied after he has arrived and envied him. Millions of people looked at the achievement of Henry Ford after he was arrived and envied him because of his good fortune or luck or genius or whatever it was that they credit the Ford's fortune. Perhaps one person in the entire hundred thousand knows the secret of Ford's success and those who do know are too modest or too re reluctant to speak of it because of its simplicity. A single translation will illustrate the secret perfectly. A few years back, Ford decided to produce his own v famous V8 motor. He chose to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block. The instructed and instructed his engineers to produce a design for the engine. The design was placed on paper but the engineers agreed to a man that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gas engine block in one piece. Ford said, produce it anyways. But they replied, it's impossible. Go ahead. Ford commanded and stay on the job until you succeed no matter how much time it requires is required. The engineers went ahead. There was nothing else for them to do if they were to remain on the Ford st staff. Six months went by. Nothing happened. Another six months went. Another six months passed and still nothing happened. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the orders but the thing deemed out of question impossible at the end of the year Ford checked with his engineers again at the end of the year Ford checked in the engineers and again they informed him they had found no way of carrying 
to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford. I want it and I'll have it. They went ahead and then as if by stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. The Ford determination had won once more. The f this story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum of substance of it is correct. The story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum in stub substance of it is correct. Of of it is correct. Uh, deduce, deduct, um, deduct, deduct, deduce, deduct from deduct. I don't know. Det uh, deduce from it. You who wish to think and grow rich, the secret of the Ford millions, if you can. The secret of the Ford millions, if you can, you'll not have to look very far. Henry Ford is a success because he understands the and applies the principle of success. One of the st is a desire. Knowing what one wants, remember this Ford story as you read and pick out the lines in the, which the secret of his stupendous achievement have been described. If you can do this, you can lay your finger on the particular group of principles which made Henry Ford rich. You can equal his achievement in almost any calling for which you are suited. It has been 49 minutes to reading this. It is hard. We got literally like a page left. Um, you are the master of your own fate. The caption, the captain of your soul because Oh, you are the, you are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because when Henley wrote this prof, prof, prophetic lines, and I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the master of our fate, the captains of our souls, because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that uh, the ether, either, he should have told us that the either, that, that the either, ether in which this little earth floats in floats in which we moved and have our own being is a form of energy moving in an inconceivable high rate of vibration and that the ether is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of thoughts he holds he hold we hold in our minds the influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know why it is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us with great emphasis that this power makes no attempt in discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts that is w will urge us to translate into physical reality through thoughts of poverty just quick as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches he should have told us to 
that our brains become magnetized with the dominant, dominating thoughts which he, we hold in our minds and by means with which no man is familiar with these mag magnets attract to us the forces of people the circumstances of life which harmonize with the nature of of our dominating thoughts he should have thought uh, he should have told us that before we accumulate riches in great abundance we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches and for riches that we must become money con conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it but begin but being a poet and not a philosopher Hen Henley contented him himself by stating a great truth in poetic form leaving those who followed him into interpret the philosophical 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 meaning of his lines little by little the truth has unfolded him itself until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book had a uh, book hold the secret of mastery over our in economic fate we are now ready to examine the first of these principles maintain a spirit of open-mindedness and remember as you read they are in the invention of no one man the principles were gathered from life experiences of more than 500 men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts men who bring began in poverty with but little education without influence the principles worked for those these men you can put them to work for your own enduring benefit you will find it easy not hard to do before you read it the next chapter i want you to know that if that conveys factual information which might easily change your entire financial destiny as it has so definitely brought changes to stupendous proportions of two people described i want you to know also, the relationship between these two men and myself is such that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, even if I wished to do so. One of these, one of them has been my closest personal friend for almost 25 years. The other is my son, own son. The unusual success of uh, these two men uh su success um which one uh one such as the i could have taken no liberties in fact even if i had wished to do so one of them has been close to my personal friend for almost 25 years the other is my own son. The un unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredited to the principle described in the next chapter, more than ju justifies the personal refer references as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Almost 15 years ago, I delivered the com Men commencement address at Salem College, Salem, West Virginia. I emph emphasized the principle desired to in the next chapter with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appro 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 appro
incorporated it and made it a part of his own philosophy. The young man is now a member of Congress and an important factor of president, present administration. Just before this book went to the publisher, he wrote me a letter in which he is clear, uh, clearly stated in his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter that I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to this chap to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. By my dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I must state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean several years of labor and responsibility to for you, but I am inherited I inherited to make the suggestion because I know your great love for rendering useful service. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College when I was a member of the graduating class. In, the, in that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state and will be responsible in very large measures measure for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College and in that way give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your own many years of experience and association with the men who by their greatness have made America the richest nation in, on earth. Okay. End of 2021, or 21, uh, page 22. Uh, I recall as thought it were yesterday. I recall as, a th as though it were yesterday the marvelous description oh yeah description you gave the method by which henry ford with but little schooling without a dollar with no influential friends rose to great heights i made up my mind even before you had finished your speech that i would make a place for myself no matter how many difficulties i had to surmount Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year and within the next few years every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do to get started in life. You can tell them because you have helped to solve the problem of so many people if there is any possible way that you can afford to render so great a service may i offer the suggestion that you include with every book one of your personal analysis charts in order to in order that the purchaser of the book may have the benefit of completing self inventory indicating as you you indicate to me years ago exactly what is standing in the way of success such a service as this providing the readers of your book with a complete unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues would mean to them the difference between 
success and failure, the service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback because um, because of the depression. And I speak from personal experience when I say I know these earnest people would welcome the opportunity to tell their problems and receive your suggestions from for the solution. You know the problems of those who face the necessary necessity of be of being begin necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money. People who must start at scratch without finances and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press personally autographed by you. With the best wishes, believe me, uh, cor uh, quarterly yours, Jennings Randolph. And that is chapter one. And that took um, an hour and three minutes. And I stumbled hella on that. So, yeah. Um, I'll see you on chapter two.